due to the Maillard reaction, which we'll talk about later, that's, that's the action of uh, what happens to food when it's uh, subjected to high heat. And so here's close up. This is, you can see inside, this is, we actually built some of that. These are real. This is a process that we developed when I decided I couldn't make every room in the house. So what we did was we, this was really fun. We took a picture of the room. And then we printed it out on uh, acetate. You know, like, it, it used to be in school, we had these projectors. You'd have these, like, uh, sort of slide sheets. Well, that acetate, or you can use, uh, you can use this stuff, too, the page protectors. So you put that into the uh, printer. I'm really not recommending this because I don't think it's too good for the printer. But you put this in the printer, and you print your picture on the thin acetate. And then you pour hot sugar, it's warm the sugar to a very high temperature until it's molten. You pour the sugar over it, and when you pull it off, the, the ink stays on the, uh, on the image, and it comes out kind of perfectly. So those are the rooms up the upstairs here. That was the method we did for that. Uh, it's not edible because it's printer's ink, but they actually do make edible ink. Um, so here's another year. This was, uh, this was the house. We did this out of, out of uh, a kind of dough, again, that had buckwheat and whole wheat and, and um, a dark flour in it, so that it really communicated. That's the real stone of the White House. It's as close as I can get to the actual stone of the White House before it came white. That's what it looked like in the first uh, few months when it was built. And then we always have Bo there. This, he's made out of chocolate here. And there's a little dog. And uh, this is all made out of sugar. This is real, by the way. <laughs> and that's not me. That was brought here, believe it or not, by James Madison. Uh, Madison was the ambassador to France before he became president. And when he came back, he brought all this loot back with him. And it's still sitting there. It sat there since Madison. What is that, like 1830? There's no American history. Um, somewhere around there. And Monroe, too. James Monroe also was a friend of file. And he brought similar things like this mirror over there. So being surrounded by that wonderful history and this, this, all this commitment to uh, our democratic ideals was just a fantastic experience for me. And then when Mrs. Obama came into the White House, she um, asked all the chefs to help her on this program called Let's Move, and in which we planted a garden on the South Lawn, uh, and we invited kids to come from the Washington, D.C. schools to plant the garden with us. So um, she would invite them every year, and they would come during the year, they would come for the harvest, and and then we would harvest the food with them, and they would, um, we would, they would cook it right there on the South Lawn. What a fantastic experience. <laughs> I'm sure these kids will never forget. Um, and uh, she's, you know, she's such a heartwarming person and, and loves kids, and they love her. So it was uh, what a great way to spend a day. You know, like, one, I think it might have been this day. You know, we were reading about Syria and all the terrible things happening. But to plant a garden with kids in, in, a, in the spring is really kind of great. So um, that's, that's sort of the let's move part, the social responsibility part of what we do in our group and what uh, Bio and his group does here, the Fire Bellies and the Young Chefs. Uh, I had a chance this weekend to visit one of the schools, fantastic opportunity with the um, fifth, sixth, and seventh graders. And, um, and, and for some reason, we both kind of connected on this science thing. And um, I was... Um, teaching this course on food and science. I shouldn't say teaching it. I was just going there and cooking. I, I would make a recipe, and then the professors would explain the science behind it. And uh, we really got interested in it. We, got, we found it so fascinating, and it led to so many different kinds of science. So this picture here, which is not that clear, is Steve Howell. He's the, uh, mission, the project mission scientist for the Kepler telescope. So the Kepler telescope orbits the Earth at like, something like 93 million miles away. And it focuses on different parts of the sky. I'll show you some of the photographs. And the purpose is to, to monitor and kind of and research what's called exoplanets. So, does anybody know what exoplanets are? Shout it out. Anybody? Exo means another and, and planet. So, these are planets that revolve around stars other than our sun. So, even though they're thousands of light years away, they have detectors, these light detectors in their telescopes, which when the, uh, when, say this is the, you know, like the big sun, and then when the planet 
which is going in an orbit, if, it, if it's on a plane with the Earth, with our telescope, at some point it comes here and it goes in front of this star. Well, that's, I don't know if that's a scale, probably, probably just one little grain of chocolate would scale. But that diminishes the light from the star enough that these detectors can tell. In fact, their detectors are so sensitive that they can notice the loss of a single photon. <laughs> so, so this goes into this, this dark a little bit of the, the image, and then what's really interesting is when, is when the planet gets here uh, at the, the edge of the, of the star, the light goes through the atmosphere of the planet. Now, the atmospheres are, are always are relatively thin, like our own only goes up about um, 80 to 100 miles. But when the light goes through it, they can determine some of the composition of that atmosphere. So what, what chemicals and what, what gases are in that atmosphere. Um, so this is the amazing part, because what they're aiming to do is to analyze that. And they know that certain gases and chemicals can only be produced by an advanced civilization, such as our own. Uh, we're not doing a very good job of it. We're mostly producing things that we shouldn't be and that we're breathing. But um, in any case, it's one of the ways which they predict maybe within 20 to 25 years, they will be able to determine advanced life on these other planets. They're never going to visit them, they're never going to visit us, at least according to the mechanics as we know it now, because they're thousands of light years away. But won't that be fascinating for the game? So um, anyway, that's, we call it, so, and Steve and I do some of these uh, demos together, and we call it gas shrunk. So um, that's one that we did in Washington, D.C. And so some of the things that we talk about are some of these theories about um, stars, these different planets. So there's a man named Jan Hollis who's part of the, he works for the Goddard Space Agency in Houston, and he, he has, took a sabbatical, and on that sabbatical, he decided to study the dust in interstellar space. So something that looks like that. So as they were, as he was studying this, he was looking for, again, through, these, through this detection and light spectrum, he was able to discover aldehydes, which are simple sugars. So when people ask me, like, what does astronomy have to do with pastry? I'm like, no. So these simple sugars were, um, that he was finding are, are also, these aldehydes are also known to be the precursors of, uh, of more complex molecules and eventually of DNA and RNA. So Hollis's theory is that this dust is being spread all over the universe by exploding stars. And we're going to think about that in a minute. So um, as he does that, he sort of looks at, uh, at what is the composition of this. So his, his sort of uh, theory is that life came with sort of, this planet was peppered with these kind of, these kind of particles, which then eventually um, developed into amino acids and early forms of life. Stay tuned. Um, so but one of the interesting things I find when working with these guys is, is just the, the vastness of what they are studying. So the next few series of, of slides will show you that. So this is a little part of the sky, and I should explain to you. They, the astronomers divide the sky into what's called arc seconds. And uh, if you think of a circle as 360 degrees, uh, if you divide that into seconds, you can imagine what a small little portion of, uh, uh, if, if that's an hour, then you know these are the seconds. What a small portion of the sky they're looking at, in fact, uh, they're, their telescopes, what they're looking at is if you were here in Boston and you had a pair of headlights in Los Angeles here, that's the distance that they're looking at in the sky. Amazing. So um, the telescopes are very sensitive and, and they're looking at something like that. But I want to, so let's back away from this picture. So this is a very small portion of the sky. And remember now what we're doing is we're backing away a little bit. So this is, and the next one is similar to this the image that you're seeing there, but that's the number of stars in that, in a, that's done in a different uh, light spectrum there, amazing. So that square, the whole square that you're seeing, is that, and even though you can't see it, there's a lot of stars around there as well, it's equally populated. So that square then becomes this, so this, we call it the galactic plate, again, pastry, you see. Um, so, uh, and this, the plate is, this is actually the Milky Way, this is sort of a, a rendering of what the Milky Way looks like. 
Um, and that little, so that little portion way back where we saw those stars, so there's billions, we know that. Um, so that's an interesting one. Um, oh, this is, the, this is the chemical composition of, this, of these uh, aldehydes called, I think it's glycoaldehyde, that Jan Hollis uh, is uh, working on. So when we go, to, we go to schools, we talk to kids, and uh, we try to relate astronomy to their, um, to their you know, what, what they might imagine. So this is a picture of um, what could be plant life on another planet, especially a planet that is, uh, whose sun is a, is a red dwarf, I mean a red giant. Um, so, so the red, red star, as it starts as they get older and they collapse, uh, or as they expand rather than they run out of fuel, they begin to kind of explode and turn reddish, but it takes millions of years. So um, if your sun is the star that your planet is revolving around is red, it's quite likely that the plants will be red because that's what um, they're absorbing all the other parts of the light spectrum. So they, um, they, they speculate that that is what the plants would look like on such a planet. So now the time comes for us to talk about all these stars, and if I could have my uh, four uh, uh, volunteers here, and any other kids who want to come down, uh, please feel welcome. You may come. Don't be left out. Uh, and college students, and college students too. Why not? Why not? Okay. So this is the sing along. Your paper there. You guys ready? Do you have your paper? Okay. Good. Well, that's okay. We can we can all be out there. Okay. So uh, yeah. So you all know the song, you all know the song, it's a little star, and uh, there's actually a cartoon with it, so uh, maybe we should face that way, let's face that way, and I want to sing. So I want everybody to sing along, and we're watching you, so you must join the party. Okay, so no okay.
um, spheres, what, what is it about them? Well, um, one of the things when, when it comes to water, for example, um, or planets, it's the surface tension which makes the sphere because all those molecules want to be connected to one another and they don't want to be connected to unlike things that are away from them. So even uh, living things, sort of, the bigger they get, the, the more they look like spheres. So whales and, uh, whales and uh, elephants, they kind of uh, <laughs> We think of a flame as, as universal, but it's not. That's a flame in zero or, or less gravity becomes a sphere itself. So when you think about it, when, when a flame happens on a match or a candle, um, the, the air around it is rising from the heat that the candle creates, so it's pulling the whole flame off. But without that, it just turns into uh, basically a sphere. Here's that same flame in zero gravity from the top. And uh, here's a, a young uh, astronaut on the space station with uh, this blob of water. So we let water go carefully in the space station, zero gravity. It doesn't look quite like a sphere there. It looks like you put, I don't know, a turnip in there or something. But um, basically, it still forms a sphere. So, and so what does that have to do with baking? Well, same thing. When we're making bread and we have the uh, yeast forms, yeast, okay, is this little animal that, just like us, breathes oxygen. And, uh, and then uh, exhales carbon dioxide. Well, that carbon dioxide gets caught into the bread dough, which is this starch that forms around this, these uh, bubbles of carbon dioxide. And uh, because of the elasticity of the gluten is maintained in there, then when it's baked, that bread just like sets it in place. So that's why we have so many um, spherical shapes in baked bread and, and fermented products. Or it doesn't even have to be bread, it could be like a cake where you use baking powder or baking soda, same thing, it's, it's artificially created, um, uh, these, this carbon dioxide. So um, this process, the whole idea of spheres, became popular with Theron Adria, and so he developed uh, a method to make liquids into spheres, and it's uh, really quite interesting. So we'll, we're going to talk about it from, from a different angle later, from the angle of gels, because what it is, is he takes two gels. These gels are made, by the way, from algae, so it's, it's a natural product. But he takes one gel made from algae, and algae from which the calcium has been removed. And then there's another gel called calcium glucolactinate, where the calcium exists. So you have two different liquids. So this is the one made from the sodium alginate. That's, that's the algae that doesn't have calcium. And then this is a mango juice in which we added the calcium glucolactinate. So it's still liquid, as you can see. Um, just like, you know, we, we actually just used the, the naked drinks like this, so that was the mango one. But with that calcium glucolactinate, um, when it touches the sodium alginate in the liquid here, immediately what happens is called cross-linking. So these are polymers, which are, um, again, something that astronomers study. So, um, We'll, we'll call it a polymer, and it has a cross link, and I have some slides for that. But I want to show it to you. Let me pull it over here. So uh, can we go to the um, camera now? All right. Can you see that? I'm too much of an angle here. I don't see it well. But, um, okay, so... Calcium glucolactinate here. Now you, there's a little bit of technique here. You got to get it way down in and let it go. And now I can't take, put this back in there because I still have some of that sodium alginate on there, which will um, immediately activate in here. And it's not all that easy to actually get a sphere in this case because um, things gravity tends to pull it out and you get. These kind of stringy things, which are not that attractive to find on your plate. But you can do it all at once. You can do it in the opposite corner. Sure. Okay. Of the same. Uh, okay. Of the same container. You yeah, on the other side. Oh, uh, okay. Like here. Is that Down that way. Those, those 
groovy sort of uh, chromium sphere there, chromium sphere. Okay, so what's happening is the crosslink is, is occurring instantaneously. They're called, um, it's called self-assembly. So these, these forms are assembling themselves. Now this, we just made this fresh this morning, so there's still some air in it, and the bubbles like, come up to the top, and they want to float on the top. So we're going to have to, we'll carefully let them, uh, we'll kind of flip it over to be sure that, so these are spheres with these uh, little noggins on them. <laughs> they look like thimbles or something. But uh, you get the idea. And uh, so the, uh, the spherical thing is a very important part. This, this is obviously not something that we would say like, oh yeah, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm making dinner tonight. What do you want? <laughs> I'll have some of those mango speakers. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, this is the kind of thing that in restaurants, uh, when you want to have something very special, when you want to have just an unusual texture. Um, so I did an example of them over here in a, another uh, sort of procedure that we do um, to make foams or airs. Uh, and that is, uh, so there's, there's, I was gonna, didn't have to wait for it. So the idea is it's liquid in the center, so then when you pop it in your mouth, it kind of explodes in your mouth. Can you pop one under the... Oh, that would be a good idea, yes. <laughs> good thing I still have some left. Thank you. See, it's collaboration. <laughs> All right. Is it visible now? Yes. Okay. So yes, honey. Thanks. So my favorite dinner. That's why I married you. Mango spears. And the prime rib is not bad too. So just a fun thing, and this we love to do this with you know in schools and with young people. This is a different way to look at. Um, at the ingredients that we work with. So, um, another thing about spheres is that spheres are very important, as we saw in the bread. Um, so, the, I think we can go back to the slides now. So, in the bread, all of spheres, like in pastry, making pastry, um, foam or bubbles are a very important things. So, those are bubbles in the bread. We make bubbles in an egg white meringue, for example. You put the egg whites in and we're, we're whipping them. You get a lot of volume into, the, into that. Uh, or whipped cream. Um, and they say like sponge cake too. If you put like whole eggs and sugar in a KitchenAid and run it, it just becomes way up to the top. So, but in thinking about how to make these foams, um, most of them rely on lecithin, which is in egg yolks. And the lecithin uh, helps the bubbles to form. So the bubbles are really key. And um, they, so this is air in here. And out here, this is the membrane of the egg white or the whipped cream, whatever you're making. And, and so that forms pretty well. But if you add something uh, such as lecithin, so lecithin is uh, what they say, what they call uh, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. So lecithin sort of has like a, a tail like this. And then so the hydrophilic, which loves water, it wants to be out here in this liquid area. And the hydrophobic is here. This is the inside of the bubble. So it wants it's happy there. So it stabilizes a foam. So we made this this afternoon. This has some lecithin and some, uh, it also has some modified soy protein, which does the same thing. But this, all this is, is the naked uh, water drink. But you wouldn't even have to have a drink. We just did this because we were lazy. And so we, if you just put like orange juice or tangerine juice or blueberry, uh, and you put that lecithin in there and let it run, you'll get really what turns into uh, a solid. And so it makes kind of a fun milkshake. You have these, these little milkshakes here. And earlier I put some of the mango, um, I don't know if you can see that. I put one of these, those mango uh, spheres in here. So it would be kind of fun to drink. That's my little example of like a modernist cocktail party. Um, <laughs> we'll get back to this, maybe show these <coughs> to the people who are um, the back. Can you see that? Not very well. Well, you can see that. Come up afterwards. Come up afterwards, and we'll talk about this if you have time. Um, so, foams, bubbles. Bubbles are important to pastry chefs and foams. Um, it's the kind of thing that we get. Yeah, um, 
kind of things that we love to play with for textures and for new ways to deliver flavors. Because in the past, like when I was looking for a way to make something delicious, I looked to either butter, egg yolks, chocolate. So, which is great. I'm not going to those things, but they're not necessarily that good for you. Uh, in moderation, they are. But so I was always looking for new methods, and this is a way where, so there's, there's absolutely no uh, egg yolk, no butter, no cream in any of this. And then you have this beautiful mousse, which I think is kind of an interesting way to, to pursue cooking and to find out new ways and new textures. Um, let's go on. So there's two kinds of verification. This is um, one we did here. It's called reverse verification. So we took the, uh, the sodium alginate, the one from the algae, and we put it in this, in that liquid here, and then we put the calcium in the food. You can do the reverse. You can put the sodium uh, alginate in the food and dip it into calcium chloride. The only problem is calcium chloride is extremely bitter. That's called direct certification, by the way. It's extremely bitter, and you have to wash it off, and it's also continues to jellify over time. So you wind up with this kind of a rubber ball. <laughs> so in the restaurant business, you kind, of, you kind of like to do things that will sit around for longer than five minutes. So, and the reason what's happening here, what's happening in that membrane when those two um, gels come together are polymers. So, uh, polymers, again, Steve always tells me, well, we know there are polymers that exist on these exoplanets. So that's an artist's rendering. It's not a photograph. We didn't go to Kepler 86B. Um, but it may have a habitable rocky moon. And uh, the same is true of, um, of Jupiter, by the way. There's, it's, it's entirely possible that um, the moons of Jupiter could support life. But anyway, polymers are uh, something that uh, astronomers are interested in and pastry chefs. Uh, so the polymer are long chains of uh, molecules, and they are uh, they're in so many things: hair, nails, tortoise shell, cellulose, and DNA. Um, they look kind of like that. And so when they're, when they're not active, when they're in a dilute solution, this means when they're in like the, the liquid state, they look like that. But as they uh, interact, they form this gel. So gels are the next stage of what we're going to talk about, and it is fascinating. Uh, we all know jello, but uh, I'm going to show you some very interesting jellos. Um, some of the most amazing materials on the planet today. So um, they're, they're trying to cross-link there, and there is a little uh, bigger picture of it. When they start to connect, where those links happen, that's the membrane that forms around the outside. So as soon as the two come together, they start to link, and that membrane forms. That's what it looks like. You can see the intersections there, <coughs> that shape um, that, are, um, that are connecting there. So now, there was a man named Samuel Kistler in the 1930s. And bear with me, I'm, I need to take another one of my little lozenges because I talk too much. If you have questions, please shoot. <coughs> we'll give you a comment at the end too. Um, so Samuel Kistler, he was a chemist, a chemist interested in food. And particularly, he was in Missouri or Iowa, he was in a third country. And uh, particularly, he was interested in jams and jellies. He lived on an orchard. He, did, he you know, made his own jams and jellies. And he was very interested in jellies, not only from a chemical point of view, but from a cooking point of view. So he studied gels intensely. And he thought, well, gels are, we start with a liquid, and knew there was a matrix of interlocking uh, matrices that held this gel together. So it held the liquid in place. So when you make jello, it starts as a liquid. And then you add the gelatin, and it forms this lock. Okay, just like ours. These are gels too. So it formed, even though they're liquid in the center, it formed this gel. Well, he said, what if I was to, could you make a gel without liquid? In other words, just have the matrix. So he did it in many ways. What he found was, because of surface tension, he would make these, this matrix, and then, so just as we saw those lines. But when he removed the liquid from it, it would collapse because the liquid had the surface tension which collapsed and it just became nothing. So then he said, well, what if I put this in a highly pressurized environment, so under high pressure, and replace, as soon as I take out the liquid, I'll replace it with a gas immediately, and maybe they won't have time to collapse, to work. So they're called aerogels. So these things have been around since the 40s. Um, but there was a lot of other interesting scientific developments. 
And this patent, nothing ever happened to him while Pesto was alive. Uh, after he died, DuPont bought it. They didn't really find anything to do with it. Until NASA came along, and they knew about this material. And they, what they decided was there's many uses that they can, they can use it for. Because for one thing, uh, you have this, you, you, I'll show you this kind of uh, picture of it. So it's a very intricate network. And there are actually billions, billions of these interstices in, in, a, very, in a very small piece. I have a piece of it here, I'm going to show you later. Um, it almost looks like it doesn't exist. Uh, it's, it's, first of all, it's 99% air. So you can, you, can almost, you can almost see through it. So it also, because this is so fine, it, it is just, it's blue because the same reason the sky is blue, which is called Raleigh scattering. I hope I spelled Mr. Rawlings' name right. Raleigh scattering means that the blue light waves, as they hit the atmosphere, a lot of the particles and gases in the atmosphere are the same uh, size as the blue wavelength. So the sky is blue because it's all scattered, the Raleigh scattering. Well, this is a little piece of sky. I might as well show it to you. So it's amazing. So this stuff, and then let's go back to the camera, and, and here we might have to um, do a little bit of light. Can't see it, can you? Maybe with the maybe on with the white background it might be better. No, it turns almost invisible. Uh, so you see, it's transparent. And yet it's a substance. And the blue tone that you see that you'll come up afterwards and look at it. It's, please though, just be careful. Um, it breaks very easily. It's extremely fragile. It's 99% air. But and so don't squeeze it. You have to hold it flat in your hand like that, please. It's even even that kind of chips it away. So uh, please be careful with it. But I'd love you to hold it because I just think it's one of the most like magical materials I've ever seen. Um, so not only is it turned blue, but because of these you know billions of interstices. Um, it's uh, like the same principle as a thermopane window. So, and I'm sure you know about that here. So, um, it's very cold outside, and air is a very poor conductor of heat. So, you have you know double pane windows. The, the cold doesn't go in, and the heat doesn't go out. And if you do three of them, you really have a great, um, a really have a great insulator. So, NASA discovered this is a great insulator. So, it's on the Mars rover. Um, it's very lightweight, as you can see. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, it's, it, it's just uh, an incredible uh, product. So, and, and this, I'm going to go into a little bit of the other kind of gels that we use as pastry chefs, but I'm going to come back to aerogels because they're so fascinating. So in cooking, these are all the different kinds of gels, and they're all natural materials. Agar is made from algae. Caragina is a, it's named after Caragina, Ireland. It's an algae that washes up on the shores there. It's red. They use it mostly in milk products because it reacts very well with dairy. And they make milk puddings with it, and um, it's something that modernist cooks use. Gel and gum, methyl cellulose, regular gelatin, which used to be made from fish bladders, and um, as explained by Chef Anthony Karem, who was a famous chef in the 19th century. Alginate, calcium certification, that's what we just did. Um, and that's, now we're back to Arab gels. So you can see how small these interstices very, very tiny. Now, here's a picture <coughs> of a larger piece. And the next picture shows you its incredible qualities of insulation. So this is supposed to be a, fl it's a flower up there, but this, and this is a Bunsen burner or a blowtorch or something. And the flower is undisturbed. Now, besides the Tickle Pickle song, the next slide is my favorite slide of the whole thing. Um, so I hope you can see it. It's uh, an example of the insulating powers of aerogel. Like, what did they say to her? <laughs> it's going to be okay. It's a picture of I don't think they did not Anyway, NASA really liked aerogel. So aerogel was vindicated, and they made this thing. So NASA decided they wanted to collect um, the gases and particles that were streaming off of a comet. And because 
the thing about comets, just like what happened this, uh, a few months ago when they landed that, uh, that um, instrument on the comet, comets are from the origin of the solar system, so this, their materials are untouched by all the changes that happens on Earth, gravity, and wind, and all that. So they wanted to find some of these very uh, primordial objects. And so they, they wanted to catch this. So as you all know, like you have the comet with the tail here, and the tail is, uh, is mostly gases and uh, ice that have, that as the comet gets closer to the sun, are speed off into that. Well, they wanted to catch this, um, these particles. But they knew that if they just like put some kind of uh, um, net out there, that the particles would be changed because they're traveling at seventeen thousand miles an hour or something. So when they hit the when they hit the net, they would be they would combust or they'd be destroyed in another way. But by using aerogel, they were able to uh, to control the landing of those particles into the aerogel. So it's kind of like a, a, a stunt. Um, a stunt man in a movie, they push him off the building and he lands on like uh, 10 cardboard boxes and they would break his fall and he walks away. Well, also these particles in the comet, they would hit this aerogel and they would penetrate into it, but they would slowly, because there's billions of interstices, they would slowly slow down and they wouldn't heat up. They would remain in their uh, original state. And so this is the, this is the sort of tennis racket size uh, instrument they made they catch these particles, and um, it was called Comet Wild. It's a whole program that you can look up on the internet. And the, the problem is that once the, uh, these particles become lost, in them, they're hard to find. So they have to take very close-up photographs. So this is, these are actual particles from that uh, comet, which have been embedded into the aerogel. And there's so many millions of them that ask the general public to sign up to look for them. So you can go to this. <laughs> Comet Wild website, and they train you how to look for them, and they'll send you some photographs of aerogel, and you have to decide, using your training, whether they're, whether it's really your particle or not. So, you don't get paid for it, sorry. Um, so gels, okay, so that's that's end of aerogel. Gels are something which are have been used in Japan for centuries. They use agar, which is uh, from algae, and there's a whole. Um, a series of desserts in Japan called Rogashi is part of the tea ceremony, which is one of the most uh, developed artistic experiences in Japan. And Rogashi is something that is served um, at the end of that tea ceremony. And it's awesome. They, they make such, this, this one is black sesame paste, really good. And they, they have refined it to the point where it just melts in your mouth. And they have a lot of fun with it. So, you know, people in Japan love fish, so they make this little fish. Um, they make starry evening, which I love. These, these are all gels which are edible. I mean, just kind of fun to look at. Um, here's a picture of the carabina. This is the kind of moss. And they just you just take it like this, you dry it out, and then you melt it kind of in milk and strain it. And you have this beautiful milk pudding, which I'll show you a picture of in a minute. Um, that's, uh, that's the kind of thing that they do at this next slide, which is, which is Valley Maloo. That's the Valley Maloo Cooking School in Ireland. Karina Allen is her name, it's a fantastic cooking uh, school, wonderful person. Um, and uh, here's an example of the Carolina pudding that is made just from that moss that uh, is so famous in that area. So, this is a, a recipe. We can put these up uh, for, for you on the website. Um, so, we've done gels, we've done foams, we've done polymers. We did, uh, oh, we didn't finish foams. Oh, yes, my favorite. This is my second favorite, next to the lady with the blow uh, So, foams. So, can you all see well? Because this is kind of fun. This would make a, this would also, we should probably record this. Um, so, I, I, I love to make new recipes, you know. I love to come up with, uh, with new ideas. And um, so, I, I was testing this recipe. Um, and I haven't really tried it yet. I don't know if it works, but I hope so. So um, this is, uh, I wanted to make like a milkshake. So I, I put these ingredients together in here. And um, I'm going to add just a little lemon juice to it and see if it can uh, be something. <laughs>
next one I'm going to put vitamin C. So it's a known antioxidant. Um, oh, I love it. Uh, it's an antioxidant. So um, while well, the first one there is going to oxidize while we, while we finish talking, um, the second one is going to maintain the color much better. So um, these are um, these capsules. You can buy this. You can buy vitamin C in crystallized form, just as a powder. Um, but this works just as well. Plastic. Where's our? <laughs> okay. Okay. I love it. I love it. We recycle at the White House. We're not as good as you. That's not, that one wasn't recorded for me. I'll deny it. Okay, so now we have our vitamin C in there, and we have our delicious smoothie. I'm not going to make you wait this long this time. So, see if we can't get this together. Um, they ferment. So just like so many things, um, 
uh, you know, yogurt or, or vinegar or cat sauerkraut. Uh, it doesn't really taste good until it ferments. Well, it's same with chocolate. So it ferments, and here's a picture of it um, fermenting in these, one of these bins. It smells fantastic, by the way, at this point. Uh, they have, they're in these warehouses, these huge bins of this stuff in it. It sort of has a vinegary chocolate smell. <coughs> Extraordinary. Um, so it ferments, and then it has to be roasted. So roasted at about 350 degrees for 10 to 15 minutes. And that's, then it starts to taste like chocolate. Even that little seed tastes like chocolate. So this is a, um, an example of, the, of what happens. So you have the pulp degradation, you have the, the bean in the center, and you have the sugar in the fruit on the outside, and then you have the acidification as it, as it ferments, and finally the browning as, and what happens after it's roasted. So, of course, it still is quite good before, before they add sugar or, um, or not that dried milk or milk chocolate. But what happens is, what's interesting, is that two things come out of those seeds when they crush them. So, and one is a liquid and one is a fat. As we know, liquids and fat don't uh, really mix very well. So the, the uh, liquid is, is called cacao paste. Uh, it can also be called chocolate liquor, although it's not alcoholic, there's no liquor to it. So it can be cacao paste, and the other thing, of course, is cocoa butter. Uh, cocoa butter is used in cosmetics, and it's, a, it's a, a very useful fat, also very large crystals. Uh, but the two things are oil the oil and water. They don't mix, so they have to be mixed back together, and that's done by a process called conching. And there again, lecithin is added to it. Lecithin helps that emulsion take place. Take place. But uh, when it comes back together, it has to come back in just the right way, because this forms uh, when it comes back together, there are six states of crystal. They're called beta states. And only the number five state is a really good shiny chocolate. That's where the molecules have lined up in a, in a way that is, uh, is all crystallized together, and then light reflects, reflects off of it. So that's why that chocolate is shiny, because these molecules are all lined up in a crystal. If you don't temper it, or you don't bring it to the beta five state, you'll have you'll have chocolate, okay, but it won't be shiny. So this is one I made a little bit earlier today. And what's interesting is, of course, as we know, chocolate when it's when it's liquid is just pours like that. But through temperature change and these crystals, it can be turned into an interesting little sculpture. So this is something which, if it was done in a much smaller uh, size, I might use on a plated dessert. But of course, it's very fragile, and I see I've already frozen the bottom there. This, this crystallization of chocolate, the ability to make it stand up in a very thin, to make kind of a modern sculpture like that. And you could fill that with fruits or with mousse or one of our foams. And uh, that's a pretty big dessert on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all air anyway. So, um, uh, but those are the type of things. That crystallization, the ability to crystallize edible uh, substances is what really interests chefs and drives them to, to make new inventions. Uh, and it's because of that, that beta 5. So here's a, here's a dessert I made at the White House uh, last year. So we took this, this globe and, and we would put tempered chocolate into it. It's, a, it's made out of uh, plexiglass, kind of a, a globe. And then we just do it paint very, very thin on there. So that's a very paper thin shell. And we would uh, and then we would put ice cream and, and a and a uh, raspberry sauce and whipped cream and some cake and then, so you just you barely touch the outside of that globe and it collapses and you have your dessert inside. Kind of fun. Uh, we also used to do one where we would pour hot chocolate sauce on top of it and it would like the Sherwood Williams ad, you know, where the paint goes on the outside of the globe and it would just sit there for a minute and then collapse in front of your eyes. It's the world's first kinetic dessert. So um, here's just uh, here's the melting range and the, the different uh, beta forms of those crystals. 
um, the beta prime that's called that's at 61 to 67. So first of all, <coughs> no, excuse me, you have to uh, melt the chocolate up to 115 or 120 because it will take that much, and that way it's it's liquid like this, okay? And um, then you when it's, you heat it up, then you bring it back down to about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and then you raise it just a few degrees. And the reason you do that is because those beta five crystals really live uh, at about 90 to 92 degrees Fahrenheit. And so you're getting, as you're coming back up there, the other crystals are forming when you're at 87. But then when you're in that range, that's when the beta-5 crystals really come together. And you try to stop the chocolate at that point. So those are the crystals that you want. But here I said 93 to 95. So it depends on the actual, uh, the way it's manufactured, but you're in the range there. Uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> we can't have uh, we can't have a talk about uh, molecular cuisine and science without. I swear, no soap guy. Here, don't, don't worry. It just missed. Um, so without having liquid nitrogen, there no no demonstration would be uh, complete. So. Um, this was, this was actually something that was done at, um, at uh, not Fair and Andre, it was uh, Heston Blumenthal, the fat dog in England. And uh, so what he did was take caramel corn and uh, dip it in liquid nitrogen, and then when you eat it, the smoke comes out of your nose. <laughs> so we call it dragon's breath. Uh, I mean, if you keep your mouth closed, it comes out of your nose if you open your mouth. But, um, so it's really kind of fun, and if you're adventurous, um, uh, I would invite you to try this uh, with us. Come by when I'm being here all day, so uh, not too appetizing. Uh, so let me just clear a path there, and I'll, I'll give you an example of it. Uh, so this was the example that I'd like to use as, um, as one of the really fun and intriguing sort of theatrical parts of of molecular cuisine. Because there's a lot of criticism, and some people think it's only theater, it's only gimmicks, um, you know, just that kind of gee whiz factor of like, why should we do that with food? But I think, especially when we're talking about uh, kids and we're talking about science, teaching them how much fun science can be, this is a, this is a great example. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you dragons. So my, my vitamin C antioxidation thing is not really cooperating. <laughs> but it's so thick, it looks so green and purple. Um, but I think there is a little bit, this is still getting a little darker than this, although this had no water it didn't. So, okay, not every, not every experiment works. But the experiments that don't work, like Byers said, you know, we learned something from that too. The important thing is to do the experiment. So, and also, I, I vow never to use this or talk about it, especially with people who have, you know, in your science classes, I'm sure that the safety rules have been explained to you, but um, there have been some very serious accidents with liquid nitrogen, it's very sad. Um, I, I hesitate to use it. Uh, a young man in, uh, in England decided that he would transport liquid nitrogen in a thermos. So, it expands as it as, it's, uh, as it warms up and it will not stop. The thermos exploded and he lost a hand. So it's a very serious thing. Um, these are special containers uh, for transport, etc. cetera. So um, it's something just to be aware of, you know, that there, there's really a serious uh, side to using these kind of ingredients. Uh, so, okay, put our little um, caramel corn in there. And we can do this with this because the caramel corn doesn't really have much liquid. Do not try this with a strawberry or a raspberry. Um, when you put it in your mouth, it will. There's so much liquid in there that it's so frozen that it will really burn your tongue. I heard. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes out, it's still pretty cold. 
go. That's uh, it's really kind of fun. Um, 
Why not? I mean, I know, yeah, I know people that do it at home. Just, they're, they just find it fun. Um, this, and, and all this information, unlike years ago, is available online. The ingredients are available online. They're not expensive. Uh, good explanations and good websites. One of the great websites on this is so fascinating. It's called Chemos. Um, and you know how it is these days? You don't even know where these people are. I, I think you might be in Denmark. Uh, Chemos is a fantastic website with all kinds of recipes and, and people sharing ideas on uh, this type of thing. Uh, no, it's never going to replace roast chicken. First of all, it's not that satisfying as a, you know, culinary experience. I mean, it is intellectually satisfying and it's fun, especially I think in desserts, to kind of play around with, with these kind of structures. Um, but and it's kind of, even, even in the professional world, I think it's moved out of the restaurant as being like the whole restaurant is about this. And it's become part of the mainstream. Like you'll, you'll find spheres or you'll find liquid nitrogen or foams here and there. But it's blended in with a much broader and more traditional type of cuisine. And I think that's as it should be. So now, I get to ask her a question. OK, well, she should ask it herself. She could do fun. Oh, all right. <laughs> it's scary. It's, yeah. Uh, she wants to know if you ever baked from the president's dogs. <laughs> <laughs>
become this one unified structure. But it is just, um, it is a liquid dispersed in a fat. Well, if you, uh, if you change that ratio by adding water, for example, so if you melt it, um, for one thing, melting it over like 92 to 94, you will, uh, above that, you're going to separate it. If you never go above 91, you didn't have to temper your chocolate. So that's, and that's how pastry chefs used to do it. We used to put, in restaurants, I, I fell in a wee bowl of chocolate and put it above the oven. I didn't know what I was doing because I had no, no idea about any of this stuff. But now I realize it was 91 degrees there. It melted without ever coming out of temper. And so you could use it. But if, if, if it goes higher than this and you melted it, and you, then you add water to it, that will break up that structure. So it won't maintain that structure. The water molecules will come in between and they'll break out the, the cocoa butter. Just like if you temper it wrong and you put it back in the uh, table or refrigerator, uh, over time, this kind of white, uh, like, scummy substance comes to the surface. There's nothing wrong with it, it's just cocoa butter. But if it's, um, if it's well tempered, it will maintain shiny and it'll stay dark like that for a long time. I'm not claiming that's well tempered, it was just done a little while ago. So it could still, the cocoa butter could still come out. But I think it is. I think, I think it's. So it has the shine, it has that characteristic snap, and one of the most important things is that with a very, very thin uh, structure, it'll maintain itself. But to answer your question, um, when this is out of whack because the water molecules are in there, the cocoa, but the cocoa butter will come out and stay out, and you won't get it back in. No. Mm -hmm. Oh, good, we have to try it too. <laughs> Um, I'm curious to know if lecithin is only in egg yolks, if you just said that for a moment. No, it's, what, it's the most common form of it. You can buy it as granules, and we do sometimes, to make these kind of foams. Um, you mean naturally occurring? What is occurring? It, it's in a lot of foods, in plants. Um, I'm, not, I'm not up on it enough to be able to answer you. Like, where else could you find less? Soy. Soy is really common. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so we have had the ultimate teaser, which is that you are billed as the crust master. Oh, yes. So what um, hints do you have for us in making our pie? Oh, I wish you would come last night and do the whole class. I'll do it quickly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, the crust master, I never heard President Obama utter that word once. <laughs> this is Obama's whole thing. So, okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll refer you to a New York Times article, which is really great, written by Amy Roa uh, a couple months ago, or maybe a year ago, maybe more than that, but it's called Biophysics. So, um, this is uh, Amy was one of the people that started the Harvard course. And uh, she continued out at UCLA now, where she's, she has been out there. And she, has, she does a program called Science and Food. Anyway, this is it in uh, New York Times. If you, if you Google that, it's really interesting. So one of the things that is important is not to develop gluten. So gluten, as we know, is in flour. And if you work your dough too much, it becomes elastic. So you start out with your flour okay, in the bowl. And uh, then you put your butter, like very finely cut up. They always say pea size. That's good enough. So pea size butter and very cold. But, and then you kind of scramble that together just by hand or even in the kitchen aid. Because nothing can happen. The gluten won't develop until you add the water. So you add it. So you have these like little squares of butter. And then you have your flour in here. And you're mixing it together. So what's happening is all this little butter is getting broken up. And it's getting coated by flour. That's what you want. Now, you pour the water in there, okay? So you have the water, and very cold water, ice water is best. That's because the warmer it is, the more that gluten is going to relax and form. You don't want it to form. So you add the HTO, H2O. <coughs> and if this is your butter nugget, surrounded by flour, the water hits it, and it forms kind of a dough around your butter, which is a good thing. Now, when you put this dough into the oven, this butter, which has some liquid, some water in it, expands, the water evaporates, and that's what makes the flakes. So that's why you have layers of flaky dough when it bakes in the oven. 
So the other thing you can do is a little bit of salt. We were talking about this last night. Amy has an experiment with her students where she added vodka instead of water. So what happens is it still forms, but being vodka and high in alcohol, it evaporates quickly. So according to them, uh, they're college students, okay, no offense guys, but you know, they thought vodka was a good idea. It probably is. So, um, so, you know, so it makes a very flaky crust, and uh, then don't overwork it, that's the other thing. What else can we say about those? Lard. Lard, oh, of course. Oh my god, you would have to say the L word. So, okay, you got me started. Uh, so, I like lard. Why? Because the fat crystals are larger, and the best lard is leaf lard. So, sometimes in farmer's markets you can find that. So, um, this is, this animal, this wonderful animal. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 